Welcome everybody to the Kim Barrett Show. I am your host, Kim Barrett. And on today's episode, we have the legendary Mr. John Wall. So this episode is all about understanding data because so many small businesses actually don't know what they're doing with data, what data they're collecting, and also what to do with it. So in this episode, he really breaks that down. It's like, what should you do as a first port of call to start collecting your data and make sure it's secure, and then how to really leverage that data and get insights out of it as well. And we also go down a little bit of a tangent about growing podcasts because he has a tremendous podcast as well. So my uh, curiosity came out there. And of course, guys, if you need help taking your marketing data to the next level, getting lots of leads so you can grow in more sales, head on over to www.mogulcall.com. We'd be more than happy to help you out and see if we can help you grow your business to the next level, leveraging Facebook advertising and all the data there. But let's not delay anymore. Let's jump into the show. John, thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Oh, thanks. It's my pleasure. Now, uh, I always like to ask this question to start off with, which is that if someone comes up to you at a party and they're like, John, what do you actually do? What do you tell them? Yeah, that's a great question. Is it in you know the marketing space, people just kind of glaze over. The pitch that we use at Trust Insights is that we light up dark data. And so everybody can kind of get this idea that you know every company has data and spreadsheets that are hidden away that they don't know what to do with. And so we get into that data and we give them some actionable insight. That's the big thing. It's not just analyzing the data, but it's taking the data and then saying, okay, here's what you need to do next. And that's the step that so many people miss. Hmm. And with that, with, with data, right? A lot of people, I think, especially small businesses, they're like, oh, like I have some data, but I'm not a big company. So it's not really important for me to know about this, track this, re- report and record it. What's your viewpoint on that? Like how important is having good data? It's everything. I mean, there's a bunch of studies that have been done recently about, you know, companies that do a better job of managing their data. They can be, you know, two to five times more profitable and more valuable than companies that don't. But really, you know, a lot of what we've done is around this idea that, yeah, you know, a small company can't afford you know, $200,000 to have a data scientist come in. So have firms like us come in where we can just work, you know, an hour to a month. And so you can get at least the, you know, the 80%, the easy stuff off the top and have somebody help you with that at a fraction of the cost. And so you can at least start to dig into your data and, you know, see where your big problems are. The, the big one, you know, Google Analytics. I mean, it's free to get it set up. You can set up some goals and that at least will give you a little bit of a picture of like, you know, what content's most popular, what stuff's working, what's not working. And you're no longer shooting in the dark. Yeah. With what we do, and we do a lot of stuff around Facebook advertising. We help people as well. We have a partner company where we help people get PR and stuff. So we're on the very much front end of it. And there's all that back end information that comes through. What are a couple of the key areas that really business owners should be really understanding their data in? Because I think a lot of the time they're like, oh, Data is something like for big companies where they've got hundreds of staff and, you know, you mentioned obviously Google Analytics being super important. What are some of the other key areas that people really should be focused on understanding the data of in their business? Yeah, you know, the easiest place to begin is with your customers. I mean, you know, have uh, some kind of customer relationship management. So you're tracking everything that they're doing. You know, the more data you can get from your customers about how you use your product, the more of an advantage you're going to get over your competition. So anything where you can track, you know, what you've sent them, what they have responded to, what they haven't responded to, you know, how often they're coming in, what are they buying? Where did they, you know, where did the new customers come from? You know, what are your best source of referrals? All that kind of stuff around the the whole customer's journey. That's the best place to start with data just to try and again, get a picture of what's going on and, and where, you know, where your marketing spend is actually delivering for you. Gotcha. And I've got a, like a, a bit of a backtrack question here, but I'm assuming that you didn't, when you were a little kid, be like, when I grow up, I want to be a data analyst and <laughs> data scientist. Like, what was the actual progression from, you know, starting out to actually then, you know, in, coming into your, your company as it is now? What was the kind of the transition across all of that? And what, what got you so interested in it? 
Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? The, the kind of path that we end up taking. I mean, yeah, I went to university and studied economics. So I did always think that I was going to be in banking or finance or something like that. And I think I, you know, grew up during the 80s. And it was just that everybody was going to be rich. You know, you pretty much assumed that you were going to be retired by the time you were 35 years old or whatever. And of course, that doesn't come to pass, you know. And then the other thing that's amazing that I've made it to where I am, is that I really fell into the trap early of you know, that there is a career path that if you work hard for somebody, like eventually you'll end up in a great position. And then, you know, as you go on, you realize that's totally not the case. In fact, most of the time, if you're working hard for somebody, you know, you're making them rich and they have no incentive for you to move. They want to keep, you know, getting rich off of you. And so making that transition to taking more risk and, you know, starting my own company now and working with my partners here on this is, has been a, a huge path of it. But yeah, and it, for me, I'm, you know, not the kind of person that like had this grand vision for me, it's just always been always keep learning, you know, gather customers, make them insanely happy so that they pay you money and everything else after that will just take care of itself. And so, but a big shift for me was, you know, I was in the insurance industry for a couple of years after I graduated and that was at the point where tech was really starting to take off. And immediately I was like, oh my, this is the stuff that I want to play with. You know, I love setting up tech and helping people use tech to become more powerful, you know, so that they can become more profitable or get more free time, get more done. That really was something where I, I found a passion. And yeah, you know, from there, it just was, you know, tech company after tech company. I got caught in that loop and still running it. Yeah. I love it. So what was the first piece of tech that you jumped into and you were like, oh, and, and what did you see the application of it? What was it that got you that kind of that light bulb for you? Oh, well, you know, I've been like a geek forever. I mean, when I was a kid, there was a company here, Radio Shack, that made this computer, the TRS-80. That was the first kind of home computer, you know, that had a full on keyboard. And it actually, it ran what was called GW Basic, which was Bill Gates' WG William Gates backwards was GW basic. And so, yeah, that's where I started off, you know, doing some basic programming and, you know, and it's just so hilarious thinking back upon that now. I mean, the machine I had was hardcore and that it was 16 K. So, but it, that was still enough where after about four hours of typing, I could completely fill the computer. You know, there was no space left. I would run out of memory just typing by hand. And in those days, you know, programs were saved on tape cassettes. You would actually plug in a tape cassette and it, you'd wait about five minutes for it to fill up the, the machine. So yeah, you know, my, my geek street cred goes, goes way back, but I think other kind of key improvements, the adoption of laptops and emails was just like everything changed at that point. And the Microsoft office suite, because I mean, people don't even think about it that much anymore, but you know, my dad worked in an era where there was an entire army of people that all they would do is like type and take your calls. Like pretty much every executive would have at least one person who was just typing and kind of doing this stuff that we all just do on our laptops now, you know, without even thinking about it. So yeah, everything changed at that point. And we're still dealing with the shock of all this stuff, you know, I mean, it's still to this day, it's like the fact that we can communicate with everyone instantly. I mean, even like look at, you know, H1N N1 virus in like 2009 was actually crazier than coronavirus that we're dealing with today. But, you know, with social media and all this stuff now, like we're watching it right from ground zero real time. I mean, it's just insane. Yeah, it's kind of, I'm getting crazy meta here, but it is, it seems like humanity is kind of coming out of its infancy and maybe we're in like the teenage years now where it's like, suddenly we can do a whole lot more, but it's a little bit weird too. There's a lot of stuff going on. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, it, it is crazy. And you see that, obviously, especially to, to reference that, like with the corona that's going on at the time we're recording it, and then, you know, all this stuff being blocked off and people, and, you know, in Australia, I don't know if it's the same over there, but literally there's a toilet paper shortage because the government put out a notice, someone shared it on Facebook, and it's like, the essentials you need in crisis is toilet paper, canned food, water. And you literally go to half the shops and all the toilet paper's gone, all the water's gone, <laughs> I was like, what is going on here? I went to the shops the other day and I was like, I don't want to be one of those crazy people, but I kind of need to buy some water and toilet paper. And now I can't because I look like I'm a, a crazy Corona guy. So uh, it just amplifies everything that's going on, right? Which is insane. Yeah, no, it's nuts. And there's been some stuff here. It is very similar here. In fact, this week, it actually kind of the panic hit here for the first time as we have cases going. But it, like that statement of go get water and toilet paper. Well, that's just like general disaster preparedness. You know, for this case, they've actually put out notices here saying, look, your, your toilet paper is actually made here. 
So you don't have to worry about shortages in China because like we're not going to run out of toilet paper. But yeah, yeah it, it isn't, it's, it's amazing all the different things because like we were panicking here too. Like just this week, there's been, we've had four events bail in the, in the past week, you know, like we're not doing this anymore, but suddenly we're like, Oh wait, now like two or three of these we had given up on now that they're virtual, we're actually going to be able to jump in. And, and, you know, you see stocks plummeting, but at the same time, it's like, yeah, all the stores are sold out of everything. I mean, the retail explosion has been insane. So yeah, I don't know who knows where any of this is going to go, but it's definitely crazy times. Yeah, it was interesting how just a small change has that effect. So same as like, I, you know, we specialize in Facebook ads and the F8 developer conference has the in-person portion has been completely canceled. And then now they're doing only digital and maybe some local stuff. But in, in Australia now, they've got travel bans on Korea, Italy, like, right, like pretty much every, most places in Asia, Hong Kong. So it, it makes a huge impact and it's just, uh, it's crazy. And it's all, it was all driven now by our ability and connection through technology for all of this to kind of pop out, you know, one person puts one post up about something that happens there locally and then it's spread across the entire world. So it's, uh, it's, it's crazy how it works these days. Yeah. I mean, like I'm really hoping here too, because we have kind of a challenge in that some of the more rural areas, you know, internet connection is not as good. And this may be an opportunity for us because they're saying that stopping schools is a great way to pr slow the spread of the disease but people that are living in more rural areas, they can't do the whole virtual school thing. And so maybe this will kind of get our tech infrastructure up to where it needs to be for the whole country. I'm hoping that, uh, you know, that could be a bright side to some of this. Yeah. Well, fingers crossed, fingers crossed it is, and it uh, comes off nicely for all, everyone without too much drama. <laughs> but so, so with yourself, when obviously you were going and you're working, you're identifying that technology is growing, things are happening there. And, and you kind of must have seen, I'm assuming like a bit of a need in the market. Like what was it that grew you to start your own company? What did you, and then what was the, the startup process there? Because obviously just jumping in and being, I think a lot of people think it's like, oh, you do something in technology and suddenly you're a very sexy Silicon Valley type <laughs> person and someone gives you, you know, $50 million for a seed round and you just, you're like, you know, on the, you know, it's, everything's easy. What's the, what's the actual realities in that space? Yeah. How does that, you know, I think you, you've, I'm sure you've seen these same diagrams of, you know, the, the public <laughs> sees it as this, like you go along and you get a choice and then suddenly you hit the trophy and the reality is, you know, you fail 65 times and you finally just stay in long enough. But there is a little bit of a method to the madness in that you, you basically keep earning the, stri the stripes to try and take on more and more risk. And it's funny too, that's kind of what forced me because I did, you know, the first kind of startup thing where, you know, it's like VC backed or some kind of angels come in and running the company with a ton of money. And of course you make them rich. And then that's where you're starting to think like, oh, wait a minute, like I'm working like a dog and they're leaving with all the money. You know, they're taking the bag as they go out the door. And I've had mixed experiences with that. You know, there's, there's been somewhere on the way out the door, they're like, okay, yeah, now let's give you some money to make your next jump. And other ones where people just leave. And then of course, I, I haven't had any that have been like explosive flame outs. I've had a couple that have just kind of burned out and gone away, but they had graceful exits, which is very, is really important in the long run. But then, yeah. And then the worst one, you know, there were a couple of moves where, you know, to be an entrepreneur and take on this level of risk, you have to be a little bit crazy. And unfortunately, you know, I've been at a couple of places where they were more than a little bit crazy. You know, they were just like flat out psychopaths. And so after going through that route a couple of times, the one thing for me that really helped was doing marketing over coffee, the podcast, that was my side gig. I mean, we've been doing that for over 12 years now. And so about eight or nine years in that started to kind of become a real business. And then what happened at the same time, was my co-host, Christopher Penn, he, same deal. He was at Shift PR, this PR firm. And, you know, they built it up over a couple of years and they got acquired and the founders all cashed out. And then he realized at that point, well, I'm actually doing more analytics than PR. So I'm going to split off and do my own analytics thing. And so he and our third partner, Katie Robert, did that. And at that point, I had a startup that was kind of flaming out. And they both knew I could do, you know, sales and biz dev because I'd been doing it for the podcast. And so... They said, you know, why don't we just get together and work on this together? And so that was about two years ago where we, you know, got together on that. But yeah, it's, it's been kind of for all three of us, you know, it's kind of like, you know, you have a hit, maybe a, a double or a triple and, you know, one or two that burn out. And yeah, now we've finally kind of grown up and become adults and this is our thing and we've got a chance to grow something. So yeah, it's, you know, a lot of sleepless nights, but we're in charge of our own destiny. So that's a fantastic thing. 
I love that. And I'll ask you about the, a little bit about the podcast as well. Obviously, I love going on people's podcasts and having people on mine. What did you, when you said it became its own kind of business, like tell me just a look, just touch on that a little bit for me. Like, what did you do there? What did it start to transition into for you guys from that point? Yeah, it's, you know, it, I mean, it was always built around the initial idea that you, what we had kicked off with, you know, talking about your introduction, like as marketers and tech people, like you can't go to the family gathering and talk about what you do at work, like people's eyes glaze over and they don't want to hear it and they don't understand. They have no idea what you're talking about. And so to have this community of people where we could talk about your Facebook ad campaigns and your Google ad stuff and, you know, jokes about email vendors, you know, stuff that the rest of the world just has no idea you know, or, or care and rightfully so, because if you're not in it, it's, it's boring and esoteric, but we created this community where we're just doing this 20 minute a week talk about the stuff we're running into, you know, and giving people basically tips and tricks. That's, you know, we do so much iterative stuff where we're always running campaigns or ads or whatever. And you're always learning as you're going, you're like, Oh, here's a little trick that makes it go easier. Here's how to make this tool work better for you. Here's what Google's up to this week. And there's just no shortage of stuff that you can continue to talk about with that. So, so we did that for, you know, five or six, seven years. A neat thing, a side thing of that was we reached a point where we kind of got in with a bunch of publishers because they knew that we could sell books. And so now authors would come to us and, you know, we were lucky enough that, you know, you finally realize how that whole system works. Pretty much like any time a big person has a book come out, they're willing to talk to anybody. So all these people that you've been tracing for years, you know, if you hit them, uh, two months before they're about to drop a book, suddenly they'll take your calls and you, you've got a chance to get them on. So, you know, we managed to get in some decent guests. And then the final you know, piece of that was, you know, when you hit a point where you've got enough to get advertisers interested, you know, when you're starting to do like more than 10,000 downloads a show, that's when things change and kind of people start to appreciate your audience and they want to get access to folks. And the key for us is it's always been very focused, you know, it's marketing and tech. So we have, you know, LinkedIn ads and Ahrefs SEO tool are on board. And it's just, we have a bunch of companies that want to talk to this audience very specifically. And so it's not, they're not going to buy TV ads. They're much more, they'd much rather talk to, you know, 14,000 marketing over coffee fans than to buy a Super Bowl ad because they know that, you know, 99% of the audience is interested in what they're, what they've got. Yeah. No, I love that. That's great. I think that's very important with anything, right? So you've got to have the right niche and the right offer for them. And then if you put that out there, people are going to want to take it and take advantage of it. Was it five years? How long did it take you to get to the point where you had that, that critical mass, what Pete, then people were really interested in, obviously, you know, connecting and seeing if they could potentially leverage part of your audience? Yeah, it's, you know, it started fairly early and we were just like really fortunate that HubSpot was local. We were all in the Boston area and they noticed maybe three or four years in early and they became an early sponsor. Another was a company, Blue Sky Factory, that was an email service provider. And, you know, they had done so well with it. This was like around 2011, 2012. They actually got acquired and went away. They been, and they told us as they were had cashed out and left that, you know, the leads we get from you guys do better than the leads that ask for pricing or to do a demo on a website. You know, it's just, it, it makes sense. I mean, we talk about email every week. So pretty much everybody wants, you know, that's listening to the show is going to be buying something email sooner or later. So that started early and it was just like a sliding scale thing. I, I mean, at the very beginning, I think we were charging like 500 to a thousand bucks for a quarter, even, you know, for 10 shows at the very early in the game. And then we kind of hit that thousand dollar a show mark and then, you know, crossing over to 2000 you know, it's just continued to ramp up. And it, as long as you've got the numbers to back it up, the sponsors are there. And the numbers are so crazy that, you know, somebody paying $25,000 for 10 episodes of marketing over coffee is like a rounding error if they're doing TV ads or something else. You know, it's like they just, that's, they don't even have to think twice about it. The, the real challenge is they need to have enough traffic. You know, if you only have 5,000 listeners, it's not worth the paperwork for them. You know, you have to stay in small businesses because the big agencies, you know, don't even want to talk to you. That this just doesn't make it worth their while to chase it. Yeah, and sorry to go too far down the podcast rabbit hole, but I'm just always just curious. And when you mentioned that, I was like, I'm just want to ask some more questions about that because I like it's super interesting. What avenues grew the podcast the fastest for you when you were obviously growing it out there? Because I know there's so many people these days, and it's like cool, just you know, consistent, but uh, valuable content over time always is going to grow. But whether any being that you're a marketing and an analyst and uh, you like the data, 
like what were, was there anything cool little like tips or tricks where you're like we did this one thing and it actually worked really really well and that helped just kind of grow yeah i know that you know that's that's the worst part i have bad news for <laughs> anybody that's trying to spin this stuff up is that um it, slow organic growth was totally the thing you know and it's just still over like the 12 years it's like between 10 and 25 percent growth you know year over year you just kind of keep picking up people as you go the only thing that you know is guaranteed to pull is if you can keep leveling up on your guests you know because like when seth godin's on the show i can go buy a whole pile of facebook ads for all of seth godin's fans and we can yeah. draft off of that but the problem is that's totally another long-term thing of like you know, you kind of have to get some better guests and that gives you the right to get the next guests. And I, the, the strategic thing of trying to work with book publishers or, you know, knowing when people have books dropping, that'll give you an edge to, to ramp up faster. But yeah, it's, uh, you know, unfortunately, it's just a ton of hard work is the, the only guaranteed uh, path to results. And that's it's pretty much the answer to everything. But everyone, I think, especially if you're in marketing or you do any sort of stuff online, you're like, but what about like, I get it, uh, but what about the hack? There's always good. Everyone's always looking for that one little tidbit, right? Where they're like, surely there's one little thing I can do. Cause it's like, we know it's value over time consistently is always going to grow anything. But I think always you, you are, especially as, as marketers. And even as you said, like with technology adoption, as we've got, we can get pretty much anything at our fingertips at any point in time. So for me, I always see with people, it's they're like, you know, like we'll set up an ad campaign. They're like, cool. It's like an hour after they've launched a campaign. They're like, have I got leads yet? And it's like, you've just literally, like, you probably haven't even <laughs> improved your ads yet. You've just launched them and they're, and they're worrying about that because we always want that instant gratification, right? Where it's like, immediately I would love some, uh, some sort of result. So it's always interesting. So I thought I'd go down a little bit of that rabbit hole there. But so for, for anyone listening though, if we, we circle back now to the analytics and the data side of things, obviously you mentioned Google Analytics is a good one. What are some tools or what are some things that people should be, even if, if they haven't been already, that they should just be really implementing and getting in place to make sure that they can collect, at least start collecting the data that they need, let alone, obviously, you mentioned some stuff about from their customers, but Google Analytics is obviously one. Is there anything else that you go is just a kind of a must have for people? Yeah, well, and, you know, Holy Trinity, we always talk about you know, Google Analytics, customer relationship management, and then email service provider, you know, have some kind of email because the, the biggest one is, all the ad networks and SEO stuff is all dependent on outside bodies. You know, if like Facebook decides they're not going to start, you know, if they have a thing against marijuana companies and they're going to stop running those ads, like you could get shut off in a day and SEO, the same thing too. If you know, the engines get mad at you, you could be stuck. So having your own email list is just so critical because then you, you've built your own asset that you can run with. So those three are big. And then tweaking those three, of course, give you a, a good route to go. But another you know, lazy man, you know, shiny object trick though, as the SEO tools are pretty cool and very sharp, you know, to get an SEO tool up and running so that you can see aggregated reporting of how Google likes you, you know, you can see what terms you're scoring for and which pages are the most popular and you can clone that. And then the other big win with that is being able to do the same thing to your competitors you know, run your competitor's websites through these tools and see like, oh, okay, my competitor over here is getting a bunch of traffic to this page. We need to, you know, our blog needs to have a similar listing of resources or whatever the hell it is. They found something that's like working and driving traffic and you need to steal that. And you can get really hooked on, you know, like, it's just like you talked about the, you know, the junkies that are checking their ad dashboard every day. It's the same thing with SEO. You can log in every morning and you'll see, okay, oh, we're up. In fact, I get a ton of emails inbound even to me like, okay, you lost five links last night from, you know, these, this content that's gone off online, but you picked up seven here and, you know, you can, you could literally have somebody just do that as a full-time job, 24 seven link chasing. And, and it usually that does pay off. That's worth doing, but it's just, you know, again, your list of marketing possible projects is, has 625 things on it. So you just have to figure out where you're going to start. Yeah, no, I love that. And this sounds interesting. And I want to find out more about this, which I think a lot of people do because, the, especially in a small business, medium sized business, even sometimes the collection of the data and analytics and actually focusing on those projects internally sometimes gets overlooked because it's like, well, we've got client work to do. We've got all this other sort of stuff. So what's the best way for them to find out more from you guys about that? If they go, that was really interesting. I want to find out more about some of these analytics and these tools. Where's the best place for them to connect with you? 
Yeah, sure. There's a bunch of places, you know, marketingovercoffee.com is great if podcasts are your thing and you want to jump on there. We have a Slack group called Analytics for Marketers. That's if you're kind of into the forum and being able to just throw your questions in and have those answered, that's a great place to start also. And at trustinsights.ai, we've got a bunch of, you know, our blog is always running stuff. And Christopher Penn does a YouTube series called You Ask, I Answer. You can literally throw him any question at any time. And, you know, usually within five or six days, he'll do a five or eight minute YouTube video on whatever you've asked and, and get you on the right path. So yeah, there's no shortage of places to go. It's just a matter of kind of what works best for you and how you like to learn. Yeah. Awesome. I love that. And now I always like to ask this question is I always say, I forget who I was on someone's podcast and they asked me and I can never remember who it was. So I love to give them credit if I could, but I forget every time. And so what's one question that I didn't ask you that I should have? That's a good question. Well, you know, one that we always throw out is talking about gear. You know, what's the latest tech thing that you've got that you've picked up that you like? Or the other one is just look to the future. You know, that, that's a big one for us. For us, you know, predictive analytics is a big part of this that we, of stuff that we do, you know, instead of just like having your list of 35 blog topics and picking one to write about this week, having yourself a calendar and being able to know that, okay, that's, you know, we're, you know, whatever it is, four weeks out from Easter. So it's the right week to do the egg post, you know, stacking that stuff is, is cool and important to do. So yeah, looking to the future is a big deal. And then just for gear, I picked up these one more headphones. I am just in love with those. They have a fantastic sound. I had to hack and mod them a bit, but so that's the geek gear that's got me excited for this week. Awesome. I love that. And we'll put links to uh, all those URLs and everything you mentioned there. What about socially? Is there any platforms that people can connect with you on more than others? You know what? Yeah, we've got a Facebook page. I'm at John J. Wall on Twitter. That's the best way if you actually just want to get direct to me, John J. Wall over at Twitter, J-O-H-N, J. Wall. That's the best way to go. And for business stuff up on LinkedIn, that's also a great place to connect over there. Awesome. Love that. Thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate you joining us today on the Kim Barra Show. Oh, thank you. My pleasure. Cheers.